Good day, everyone. Today, we'll discuss on one of the controversial breakthroughs in the field of science and technology, which is uh, the genetically modified organisms. So GM products are widely available in the market. We just do not recognize them because uh, these products are not labeled as uh, GM products. Okay, but we don't know that uh, the ingredients contained in a particular product uh, is already genetically modified. Uh, organism. Therefore, we are already consuming uh, these uh, genetically modified uh, products or organisms. Okay, so for this topic, uh, our, our, our objective is to discuss the ethics and implications of GMOs and potential future impacts. This is an example of a GM, uh, if a genetically modified organism. So in a normal corn, uh, we don't see this uh, pattern. Uh, our arrangement of corn seeds. Okay, so as you can see, it's really genetically engineered. Okay, so however, uh, genetically modified organisms does not only limit to plants, it may extend as well to microorganisms and even animals. So let's listen to a talk from a professor at Purdue University, uh, is Professor uh, Rick, to uh, give us an overview of what uh, what is uh, or what are GMOs? Okay, let's listen. Mylan, who's a this is the science of GMOs. I'm Jessica Eyes, and the question we're looking at today is, what are GMOs? And joining me to help answer that is Dr. Rick Mylan, who is a molecular tree physiologist here at Purdue University. Hi, Rick. How are you? I'm well, thanks. How are you? Thanks. Doing? Thanks for joining me. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Sure. So. First question is pretty simple, is just what does GMO stand for? It stands for genetically modified organism. Okay, so when you say organism, are you talking about just what we eat or does that encompass other things as well? An organism can be any living thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that we eat. Um, so an organism can, for example, include a bacterium. And what a lot of people don't realize is that the drug companies in the United States use genetically modified bacteria for producing medicines to cure disease as well as vaccines for preventing disease. And before the advent of this technology, peop uh, these companies would extract uh, pharmaceuticals from organs or from cadavers or from bodily fluids and use those to treat people. The problem is, is that and often, oftentimes those extractives were contaminated and would result in the transfer of disease to the patients. So by using this technology, the, the genetically engineered bacteria are producing pure forms of the pharmaceuticals that don't contain the contaminants and therefore are safer. Oh, that's great. And um, what, for instance, might be an example of a common medicine that we're all familiar with that comes from a GM source? Insulin for treating diabetes. Before we had this technology available to us, uh, the drug companies were extracting insulin from the pancreases of cattle and pigs that came from slaughterhouses. And those were, they, they, they were similar enough to human insulin that they could treat people as human patients with diabetes using insulin derived from cattle and pigs. But scientists were able to identify the gene that encodes the product that makes human insulin. So they put the human insulin producing gene inside of bacteria and the bacteria produce the insulin and secrete it and they can harvest this insulin and treat diabetic patients with human insulin. So it's, it's uh, again, it's an, an example of, of a pure form of a substance that is um, much more beneficial. In addition to producing medicines, genetically modified microorganisms can be used for producing vaccines as well. And an example of two vaccines that are produced in genetically modified organisms are one against cholera and the other against hepatitis B. Okay, so GMOs, it's not just what we eat, it encompasses a wide array of things. But jumping back to what we eat, so crops for instance, um, I know that people have been breeding corn, different corn varieties for centuries or even millennium um, out in the fields. And, and what's the difference between that type of crop breeding 
and GMOs, for instance? It, w one of the, uh, traditionally crops have been genetically improved through conventional breeding, where they take two parents. One parent has um, some traits that the breeder is interested in, and another pan plant will have a, 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 another collection of traits that they're, that they're interested in having in, a, in an individual. So the breeder will cross the two parents and select offspring that contain traits from both parents. And so through conventional breeding, you, can, you, you alter many traits simultaneously. Um, so it's a disadvantageous in that you have to do many rounds of, of what's called successive rounds of breeding and selection in order to produce an individual that contains all the traits that you're interested in having. So one of the advantages of, of genetic engineering is that we can alter uh, an individual trait. We can take a gene that's responsible for a given trait and alter that individually without affecting any of the other properties of the plant. Um, so how prevalent are GMOs? Are they common? Uh, where, where might, why, might we find them just in our daily lives? Well, there are four main agronomic crops that, not, now there are many agronomic crops that have been genetically modified. What are, what are agronomic crops? Those just. Th things that are grown in agriculture. Okay, plants all right, that are grown so just for corn, human consumption. Soy. Yeah, exactly, and corn okay. and soybean are two examples of okay. plants that have been genetically modified for various properties, including okay. insect resistance and disease resistance and herbicide tolerance, but the four major uh, a agricultural crops that have been genetically modified are corn, soybeans, cotton, and canola. Um, there are three countries in the in the world that produce about 90 percent of those four commodities. Those are the United States, um, Brazil, and Argentina. And about 90 percent of, uh, as I say, 90 percent of those commodities are produced in those three countries. And over 90 percent of those plants are genetically engineered. Okay. So, for example, in the United States last year, 94% of the acreage that was planted to soybean had genetically modified soybean. 96% of the cotton that was planted in the United States last year was GM cotton, and 93% of the corn that was planted in the United States was GM. India is another country that produces or grows a lot of genetically modified plants, in particular cotton. Beet, what's called BT cotton, which is an insect resistant. And I think last year in India, they planted 250,000 acres of BT cotton in India. So it's really integrated into our life, particularly here in the United States. And it isn't just yeah. these four mm -hmm. agricultural crops, I mean, the, the four big ones, soybean and corn and cotton and, and canola. Apple, and just last year, um, an apple variety that's genetically engineered re was released, and it's called Arctic. Uh, I think it's called Arctic apple, and it's one that has reduced browning. When you, you cut open an apple and leave oh, it on no the kidding. counter, it turns brown. So right. now this thing has been engineered in a way so that it doesn't brown as easily. Mm -hmm. And they have some genetically modified uh, potatoes that don't bruise as easily. Mm -hmm. uh, cassava is genetically modified for virus resistance and is grown in Hawaii. So it's G GM plants are grown pretty widely throughout the world. And um, are there any other ways in which GM technology could be used? Oh, yeah. Um, a lot of... A lot of people think that using GM technology, we are only inserting genes, but actually using the same technology, we can alter expression of native genes, the genes that are present in the plant. And so um, there's a fellow named Norman Borlaug who in the 60s bred a short statured variety of wheat, and Norman Borlaug was, is credited as being the, the father of the Green Revolution. And he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970, and he's credited with having saved a billion people from starvation by developing this short stature variety of wheat. But we, th using modern te molecular techniques, we figured out that the genes that he introduced through his breeding altered the expression of a hormone that influences the height growth of plants. It's called gibberellins. And so what we've done is we can genetically engineer the plant to either overexpress a certain product or to reduce the amount of a certain product that, that's produced. So in this case, we can alter the gene that's responsible for making the hormone that influences height growth. So we can accomplish the same thing that Norman Borlaug did through decades of breeding in a single year by just altering the expression of a single gene. So why would we want short wheat? There was a, particularly with rice, but it's, it's not just a problem. Well, with rice, but with other cereals. Is, uh, but it was originally identified in rice. It was called um, um, uh, foolish seedling disease. Foolish, the, seed foolish seedling foolish disease. Seedling what disease. happens is that the, the, we, we would breed rice plants to produce large panicles, lar a lot mm -hmm. of grain, but they had long, narrow 
stalks. And the, the, the weight of the, the panicles, the seeds, the grain was so much because we bred them for producing an abundance of, of grains. The seedling, the plants were so heavy, top heavy, that they would blow over, they would lodge or fall oh, over. Oh, they'd fall down. And then they'd rot in the, right. in the rice paddies. Mm -hmm. And so by producing a short statured plant, um, the, the, the stems were shorter, but they were thicker and they could support the, the heavy grains. Great. Thank you so much, Rick, for joining us to help us understand what GMOs are. Uh, we really appreciate it. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. Okay, so that is Professor Rick from Purdue University. Okay, so um, what you were talking were actually uh, were actually uh, were actually uh, were actually put in the diagram because I took this one from uh, I took my presentation from their website. So uh, what are GMOs? Okay, so GMOs are living beings that have had their genetic code tweaked in some way. Again, um, it is not just limited to plants. Uh, GMOs, uh, I mean, genetically engineered organisms may be microbes or microorganisms, and it may be animals as well. Okay, so what happens is that when a gene is inserted into the DNA of a single cell, we know that a cell undergoes cell division, and that gene will be uh, carried out into uh, every cell which undergoes a mitotic uh, or meiotic cell division, okay, or uh, cell division in uh, in in uh, in general, okay. Uh, gene technology uh, technology isn't only for crops, so it is used as well on microorganisms. So if you recall, uh, he said a while ago that one of uh, the GM or genetically mo modified organisms are bacteria. So these uh, bacteria are actually like. Um, they are modified in a way that they will no longer cause, uh, I mean, uh, these uh, bacteria were actu are actually modified in a way that uh, they can uh, produce um, insulin, okay, so and these insulin are eventually used for uh, people with diabetes uh, because before uh, our sources for insulins are normally cadavers, cattle, and cow. So the problem is that um, this may be vector for uh, for transferring diseases. Okay, but uh, with uh, bacteria, uh, which they just um, take the, the insulin um, eventually. Uh, or yes, uh, because the, the the bacteria are designed to to produce insulin, so. Um, it's it's pure, uh, meaning to say um, it doesn't have any um, um, contaminants uh, that would uh, cause uh, diseases. Okay, so uh, GMO uh, is a plant again, an animal or microorganism or other organism, which genetic makeup uh, has been modified in a laboratory in a laboratory using genetic engineering or transgenic technology. Uh, it creates combination of plant, animal, bacteria, and viruses genes that do not occur in nature or through traditional crossbreeding methods. Okay, so. Um, we crossbreed because we want to achieve uh, desirable traits. Uh, when we say desirable traits, uh, traits which we want to be expressed by a certain organism. Okay, so for example, uh, that uh, that uh, that weed, uh, in particular rice, uh, which was um, which was used by Rick as an example. So we don't want. Uh, rice to have uh, longer stems because if they have longer stems um, what will happen is that as grains will mature well it will bow down okay and um, if it bow, it, if it bows down uh, the tendency is that uh, grains might fall into into the soil or into the rice paddy but if it has a shorter stem uh, meaning to say it can uh, it can hold it can hold because it has enough strength uh, to hold the grains Okay, so that's the reason why um, the for for rice uh, they prefer to have it um, the stem to be to be uh, shorter uh, compared to be uh, compared than being longer. Okay, so most GMOs have been engineered to withstand the direct application of herbicides and or to produce an insecticide. Okay, so however, new technologies are now being used to artificially develop other traits in plants such as resistance to browning apples. That's what uh, he said a while ago and to create new organisms using synthetic biology. Okay, so there is a, an organization we name them as non uh, GMO project, uh, who works diligently to provide us the most accurate, up to date standards for non GMO verification. So, in order for this organization um, 
to identify a product as a GMO or not. So in, its inputs must be evaluated for compliance with the following uh, standard, which categorizes inputs into four risk levels. Okay, so these are the risk levels. We have high risk, low risk, non-risk, and monitored risk. Okay, so it's high risk. Um, if It is high risk if the input is derived from, contains derivative, derivatives, or is produced through a process involving organisms that are known to be genetically modified and commercially available. So what are these high risk ingredients? Um, this may be amino acids, alcohol, aspartame, ascorbic acids, uh, sodium carbonate, citric acid, up until yeast products. Okay, so common examples of um, GMO products under high risk are the the widely widely cultivated uh, GMO uh, organisms. We have uh, canola, corn, cotton, papaya, alfalfa. alfalfa. We have soy, uh, sugar beet, yellow summer, squash or zucchini, animal products, microbes and enzymes, and potato. Then if it, the, 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 pro, the, the GM organism or the GM product is considered as low risk, if the input is not derived from or does not contain derivatives or is not produced through a process involving organisms that are presently known to be genetically modified and commercially available. So examples are lentils, spinach, uh, tomatoes, sesame seeds, and avocado. Um, it's non-risk if the input is not derived from biological organisms and not therefore susceptible to genetic modification. Okay, so monitored risk if the, uh, the non-GMO uh, project carefully monitors the development of new genetically engineered products. So they're currently tracking close to 100 products and of those, they've included the following uh, in their surveillance uh, program. So uh, these products will likely soon be widespread or because of known instances of contaminations from GMOs. So such as uh, flax, uh, mustard, rice, uh, wheat, apple, mushroom, orange, pineapple, uh, camelina, sugarcane, and tomato. But, um, but apple, as said by Rick a while ago, is already uh, is actually kind of genetically uh, engineered uh uh for because uh, in a way that it will not because uh, when you cut an apple it will uh, eventually uh, turn into brown so that is uh, what scientists are working on uh, that the apple will not uh, will not uh, turn into uh, will not turn brown uh, once cut uh, or once sliced. Uh, I think it's it has something to do with pectin. I'm not just uh, not certain. Okay, so um, the non-GMO project uses a set of criteria to determine the standards high risk list, which is a list of uh, a list of crops and inputs that are highly that are highly likely to be genetically modified. So as genetically modified organisms enter the market, we evaluate the risk they pose to the non-GMO supply chain. So examples. Uh, what they take into account are the following number of acres planted, uh, commercial availability, uh, the crop's presence in the supply chain, how the crop is currently used, and how the crops could be used. So, for example, corn is considered as a high risk list because 92% of the corn grown in the US is genetically modified. And GM corn is widespread in the marketplace. So again, uh, it applies now here the criteria set by the non-GMO project that corn has become a high risk because one reason is that um, it is um, it is grown in uh, it is uh, uh, ninety two percent of the corn grown in US is genetically modified uh, for for the following reason uh, it's wide it it is widely available in the market. Uh, uh, it is widely available in the market, and it is planted in in uh, in in, uh, in a large uh, in a large number of uh, acres, or uh, in uh, in, a, in a vast amount of land, rather. Okay, so um, uh, for them to for them to cultivate uh, that particular amount or density of uh, of corn, of course, it has to be genetically modified. Okay, so because of these factors, the chance that corn-based ingredients in food found on the average grocery store shelf come from genetically modified corn are high. So this is what I'm trying to say a while ago that um, even though we are consuming certain uh, product, but it is uh, contaminated or mixed or mixed with uh, GM uh, GM organisms. So eventually, uh, we are already taking a genetically modified. Uh, are we already consuming genetically modified products? Okay, so 
Um, agricultural plants are one of the most frequently cited examples for genetically uh, modified organisms. So some benefits of genetic engineering in agriculture uh, includes increased crop yields, reduced cost for food or drug production, reduced needs for pesticides, enhanced nutrient composition and food quality, resistance to pests and diseases, greater food security and medical benefits to the world's growing population. So these are these are so far uh, some genetically modified organisms um, which uh, which have been engineered in a way that they will mature faster and tolerate the presence of aluminum boron uh, salt drought frost and other environmental stressors so um, these are uh, these are uh, these are examples okay so we have soybean we have corn we have canola and plum Okay, so uh, what they're capable of, uh, the soybean, uh, it is genetically engineered in, uh, so that it becomes tolerant with herbicides. Okay, for corn, uh, these were mo modified in a way that it becomes resistant to insect. Uh, we have now the BT corn, which later on uh, I will be showing to you a video about what BT corn is and uh, why there were uh, some controversies involved about BT corn. So altered fatty acid composition for canola, meaning to say, um canola uh, the okay so we have canola uh which could uh, which is uh genetically conferred um to alter fatty acid fast fatty acid composition and we also have a uh, plum uh, which is now a uh, virus resistance okay so Okay, so uh, again, why do we use GMOs? Uh, some GM plants are resistant to, uh, to certain herbicides, so making weed uh, control easier and more efficient. And this allows for less uh, uh, tillage of sorry tillage on less uh, soil erosion. So others create an internal defense in plant that uh, they repel any particular insects that will destroy the crop. So this means uh, less insecticide application. So. Um, other current other uh, uses of GMOs include the production of non-protein or non-industrial uh, products. And a number of animals have also been genetically engineered to increase yield and decrease susceptibility to diseases. Uh, for example, uh, what we're seeing now here is a GM a genetically modified uh, organism, salmon. Okay, so normally um, it takes three years to breed or to raise uh, salmon uh, before it's being sold. And um, the, the ones at the lower, uh, I mean, uh, um, these salmons are not actually uh, that big uh, even if again it's uh, uh, if it's raised for three years. But what uh, what scientists did is um, they are able to um, to create or to uh, yeah, uh, they're, they're, they're able to, to genetically engineer a, this uh, salmon in a way that it will just uh, grow in 18 months and uh, the size uh, uh, the size would be uh, equal with that uh, grown uh, in three years okay so and if it's uh, 18 months so it only takes uh, one year and a half uh, one year and six months Okay, so that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's, uh, that's one benefit of uh, genetic engineering. Um, in other words, um, it gives us a food security because uh, we cannot wait uh, for three years to eat, no. Uh, and just imagine if uh, that if, uh, if 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 that uh, if our only uh, source of food is salmon, but it's fortunate that we have other sources of food. Okay, but if it happens that we are very much dependent with this one, well, certainly we'll, we will be uh, starving. Okay, so uh, question now is, do GMOs harm health? Okay, so uh, GMOs are relatively new. Um, naturally, people wonder whether GMO plants and the food that uh, the foods that contain them are safe to eat. Okay, so I think um, this is this is um, this is common among uh, this is common among us that when we talk about GMOs, we're really afraid. Uh, to eat this one because uh, we didn't know uh, its effect. Uh, maybe and the effect may, may not be uh, 
right there and then. So it may take uh, some times. Okay, so however, uh, GMOs have been heavily studied and there is no evidence that eating GMOs harm humans okay so we have uh, they have been eating uh, we have been eating gmos uh, for more than 20 years and no health issues related to genetically modified organisms have arisen in this time so question like are there health benefits uh, to eating gmo foods uh, not today but scientists are doing uh, research to explore the possibility and in fact um, they are creating rice cultivars um, which uh, which are kind of, uh, which um, which uh, which could uh, which has kind of, um, higher nutrient contents compared with the others okay i think uh, we have here in the philippines the, the golden rice if my memory serves me right uh, which is uh, fortified with iron, and it's a genetically engineered uh, plant, and so we get uh, we get uh, nutrients, we get uh, iron compared with the traditional variety of uh, or traditional cultivar of rice we have. Okay, so um, what are other risk and controversies surrounding the use of GMOs? So gene alteration uh, can change organisms' metabolism, growth rate, and or response to external environmental factors. And potential health risks to humans uh, include the possibility of exposure to new allergens in genetically modified foods, as well as the transfer of antibiotic resistance genes to gut uh, flora. Okay, so this is very dangerous because um, if it happens that um, antibiotic resistant genes are transferred among us, regardless if what medicate, uh, regardless if we, we, medic we medicate ourselves with um, some antibacterial drugs. Well, um, our body could no longer expand because um, what were, what are contained inside our uh, what are contained inside our body are already kind of, uh, these uh, type of bacteria which are uh, resistant to to antibacterial drugs. Okay, so it possible as possibility as well of horizontal horizontal gene transfer of pesticide, herbicide, or antibiotic resistance to other organism would not only put uh, humans at risk, but it would also cause uh, ecological imbalances, allowing previously uh, in a, in a cause plants to grow and control, thus promoting the spread of disease among both plants and animals. Okay, so um, here is uh, one controversy uh, related to related to GMO or genetically modified organisms. So its impact was actually unintended, but uh, it's already there. Okay, so let's watch this one. Recently, the prominent science journal Nature editorialized that we are now swimming in information about genetically modified crops, but that much of that information is wrong on both sides of the debate. But a lot of this incorrect information is sophisticated, backed by legitimate-sounding research, and written with certitude, quipping that with GMOs a good gauge of a statement's fallacy is the conviction with which it is delivered. To many in the scientific community, GMO concerns are dismissed as one big conspiracy theory. In fact, one item in a psychological test of belief in conspiracy theories asked people if they believed food companies would have the audacity of being dishonest about genetically modified food. The study concluded that many people were cynical and skeptical with regard to advertising tricks, as well as the tactics of organizations like banks and alcohol, drug, and tobacco companies. That doesn't sound like conspiracy theory. That sounds like doing business. Minorities are blamed for conspiracist ideation, for crackpot theories about AIDS, but we must remember there is a long legacy of scientific misconduct. Throw in a multi-billion dollar industry, and one can imagine how hard it is to get to the truth of the matter about GMOs. There are social, environmental, economic, food, security, about diversity arguments pro and con about GMOs, but those are outside my area of expertise, so I'm going to stick to food safety. And as a physician, I'm a rather limited veterinarian in that I only know one species, human being, so we'll skip the lab animal data, which may inform what to feed one's pet rat, but not necessarily what to feed one's family. What human data do we have about GMO safety? 
This study was purported to confirm DNA from genetically modified crops can be transferred into humans who eat them, but that's not what the study found, just that plant DNA in general may be found in the human bloodstream with no stipulations of harm. This study, however, did find a GMO crop protein in people detected in 93% of blood samples in pregnant women, 80% of umbilical cord blood, and 69% of samples from non-pregnant women. The toxin they're talking about is an insecticidal protein produced by Bt bacteria, whose gene was inserted in the corn's DNA to create so-called Bt corn, which has been incorporated into animal feed. If it's mainly an animal feed, how did it get into the women? They suggest it may be through exposure to contaminated meat. Of course, why get GMO secondhand when you can get them directly? The next great frontier is transgenic farm animals. A genetically modified salmon was first to vie for a spot at the dinner table. And then in 2010, transgenic cows, sheep, goats, and pigs were created, genetically modified for increased muscle mass, frankenfurters one might say, based off uh, the so-called mighty mouse model. But back to children of the corn and their mothers. When they say it's a toxin, it's a toxin to corn worms, not necessarily to people. In fact, I couldn't find any data linking Bt toxin to human harm, which is a good thing since it's considered one of the few pesticides considered so non-toxic it is sprayed on organic fruits and vegetables. Okay, so the now famous, uh, basically the, the BT corn con, uh, controversy um, was uh, beca became famous uh, when a study uh, in the laboratory was conducted by Lucia and company. So it was found out uh, that mortality of monarch larvae uh, was higher when fed with milkweed. So their natural food supply covered in, po in pollen from, trans uh, trans from transgenic corn. So when fed with uh, over those uh, fed with uh, milk with covered with uh, pollen from regular uh, uh, corn. Okay, so uh, the report uh, by Lucy uh, and company was followed by another publications suggesting that natural levels of Bt corn pollen in the field were harmful to monarch butterflies. So um, in other words, um, it has become uh, controversial because uh, because of the side effect or because of the negative impact it has to uh, these um, to these monarch butterflies which are fed into um, the milk the milk with uh, milk with of uh, these coins okay so um, it's because basically the 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 the, the pollen uh, cover the, the milk with covered with pollen was basically altered Okay, and, and so uh, it has impact on the monarch butterfly. Okay, so other uh, impact of, of these, um, or, and yes, and another impact or another negative consequences of, um, of genetically modified organisms uh, is on economic, uh, is in, in the economic uh, domain. So private companies will claim ownership of organisms to create and not share them at a reasonable cost with the public. Okay, so if it's, uh, if it is, uh, if it is an article, so they might uh, issue a copyright. Okay, so but for the case of uh, for the case of this one, I don't know uh, how, what do we call this one? Maybe a patent that um, they're going to claim ownership of that particular uh, product, and uh, they're going to sell that one at a very uh, expensive cost. So it's no longer equitable uh, for us uh, for for everybody. Okay, especially those in the marginalized uh, sectors. So because GMOs are novel life forms, biotechnology companies have been able to obtain patents to control the use and distribution of their genetically engineered seeds. So GM genetically modified crops therefore pose a serious threat to farmers' sovereignty and to the national food security of any country where they are grown. Because if, for example, uh, they're able to create a GMOs uh, by, uh, by these biotech centers, so they might not distribute the seeds, or if they are going to distribute, they're going to sell that one at a very high cost. And for our, our farmers, could not, uh, will not be able to afford uh, such seeds. And you know, it it will have a dominant effect um, to, or the effect will cascade into our food security, um, not just as a community, but as a country and as uh, as a global community in general. Okay, so the next one is. 
Um, okay, so the next one is uh, philosophical and religious concerns. Okay, so the ethical issues surrounding GMOs include debate over our right to play God, as well as the introduction of foreign material into foods that are abstained from for religious reasons. Uh, some people believe that tampering with nature is intrinsically wrong and, other, and others maintain that inserting plant genes in animals or vice versa is immoral. So it is much like our, um, our, 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 our belief about uh, our physical characteristics that um, usually it's really the, the religious domains uh, have really strong opposition. Uh, for example, if you want to to uh, to undergo operation uh, for your uh, to your uh, to any part of your nose uh, to any part of your face to to improve it uh, because uh, you think uh, you feel confident or you think uh, you will become more beautiful uh, if you will undergo um, operation so um, in the case of gmos it's also the same uh, it's somewhat like uh, we are yes it's it's not somewhat it's really we're altering uh, what uh, the grand design of our sovereign god okay so um and that and that is uh, and that is like uh, we are taking uh, into power where we're playing uh, we're playing again uh, as, as said in this um and this as said in this article so when it comes to genetically modified foods those those who feel uh, strongly that the development of gmos is against nature or religion have called for clear labeling rules so they can make informed selections when choosing which items to purchase so this is what i said to you a while ago that uh, we cannot identify if a certain product is gmo uh, it's if it's if it's GMO product or not, so at least they're calling that uh, it should be labeled. But again, uh, another uh, another um, uh, concern for that is that um, uh, the, the product as a whole uh, might not be really a genetically modified one, but uh, its ingredients may be genetically modified products. So let's take um, let's take that it is a, a fruit cocktail, so containing uh, apples. So we know that, uh, that and one of the ingredients or one of the components of a fruit cocktail is apple. And we know that again, that apples are, uh, our apples are now genetically modified. So uh, again, uh, the point here is that um, uh, you are still consuming uh, genetically modified products. Okay, so respect for consumer choice and assumed risk is as important as having safeguards to prevent mixing of genetically modified products with non-genetically modified foods. So in order to determine the requirements for such safeguards, there must be a definitive assessment of what constitutes a GMO and universal agreement on how products should be labeled. So uh, we have to very, very thank, we have to be thankful uh, with uh, the, with the, uh, with the levels of classification by the non-GMO project of which uh, they're able to identify if that particular product is a GMO, uh, if, if it's a high level risk, if it's a non-risk, if it's a monitored risk and uh, the other classification. Okay, so um, what story on GMOs and labeling? Uh, let's watch this one. This is the Science of GMOs. I'm Jessica Eyes, and today uh, we're joined by Dr. Ken Foster, a professor of agricultural economics at Purdue University. And uh, Ken, just to launch into this, uh, we're, we're looking at GMOs and labeling. And so if you can help me here, what is the current state of GMO labeling? Yeah, well, uh, up until this summer, 2016, there were no regulations for GMO labeling. There were private voluntary labels, like if somebody was producing a GMO-free or a non-GMO product, they were labeling that uh, to make sure that they could get the extra value out of the product. Uh, but there were no regulations by government, either at the federal or state level, that were in effect until 2016. Uh, and during the summer of 2016, uh, one state was getting ready to launch a set of regulations and in, in the meantime there was a bill going through Congress in Washington and that bill passed and since then President Obama has signed it. So we have a bill. Uh, people probably shouldn't expect though to see any labels, any mandatory labels showing up in the grocery stores right away. Okay, and so when it comes to GMOs and labeling, because GMOs have been around for some time, uh, why weren't there requirements that GMOs be labeled or, G or foods containing GMO uh, ingredients to be labeled prior to now? 
they concluded that GMO food ingredients weren't materially different from their conventional varieties. So if you think about corn, let's just use corn as an example. Uh, corn as an ingredient in the list of ingredients was corn, not GMO corn or non-GMO corn, because FDA uh, concluded that those weren't materially different from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so these new rules um, that were uh, recently passed, um, what exactly do they require? What do they entail? What does it mean? Yeah, I'm not sure you're going to like this answer, <laughs> but uh, uh, we don't really know yet with great clarity because uh, the USDA has been charged with making the interpretations of the bill in terms of actual enforcement. So it's going to be up to USDA to decide uh, what exactly is a GMO ingredient. And that sounds pretty simple on the surface, but when you start to, you know, sort of drill down into it, um, then, you know, you get into uh, some, some questions that they're going to have to determine. So uh, let's take uh, soda pop, for example, that's, that's sweetened with high fructose corn syrup. There's no DNA in that in that fructose corn syrup, it's just fructose. And so uh, from a testing point of view, uh, is, that a, is that a modified food product or not? Uh, so they'll have to make that. Because, it's it's because fructose is derived from corn? It's, well, this particular okay. type of high fructose syrup mm -hmm. is derived from corn that's okay. used to sweeten soda pop, uh, but it doesn't have any corn DNA nor any foreign DNA that we use to modify the corn. That's all you know been sort of extracted through the further processing. Mm -hmm. It's just fructose syrup. Now you get into questions of, you know, natural occurring DNA that's been used for genetically engineering purposes versus uh, laboratory created DNA. Um, will, will those be treated differently? And the reason I bring that up is because there's a line in the bill that says uh, that, you know, the bill applies to food products that could not have occurred through conventional breeding or natural mutations. So who decides whether or not you know, this particular trait in a food product could have been developed right. through natural breeding or could have occurred mm -hmm. through some sort or through conventional breeding or could have occurred as a natural mutation. So, so those are the things I think USDA is going to have to struggle with. I think it's pretty clear uh, that they're probably going to side toward things that have been modified in some way are going to be labeled, but we don't know that for sure yet. Um, may, maybe more directly to, I think, what you were asking is what's going to appear on the label mm -hmm. of the food product when I show up at the grocery store eventually once USDA figures those things out. And um, this is where there's been a little consternation in the news. So most proponents for mandatory labeling, I think, envisioned that there was going to be something very visible on the label that says GMOs in this product right, or no GMOs in this product. And that's not really the way the bill has been written. So the food processors will be given a fair amount of latitude. They can do that. And I suspect that anything that does not contain GMOs is going to have a very prominent GMO-free or non-GMO label on it. So Ken, my last question for you is, uh, why did agribusinesses get behind um, having a new federal requirement? Because from my understanding, for years they had been opposed to this. Yeah, so I think it's probably useful to think about why were they, uh, you know, resistant to a labeling law in the first place. And mostly that has to do with the cost of the labeling and the potential disruptions of a fairly finely tuned supply chain. Um, agriculture always uh, faces a lot of uncertainty with weather and things like that, but then you add another uncertainty in terms of a regulation and what its effects might be. Um, and the additional costs just, I think, were something they resisted for a potentially uncertain long-term benefit. Uh, but over the last six or so months, they saw emerging a lot of state initiatives for labeling of GMO products. And uh, as those were emerging, different states were developing different regulations with respect to labeling and the, the idea that you might have to have a separate label for each of those states. Uh, and the additional cost of that, I think, drove them to the idea that one label for the whole country that would satisfy all of these would be the least costly approach. Great. Thank you so much, Ken, for joining us to talk about GMOs and labeling. I really appreciate you delving into the details with us. My pleasure. All right. Okay, so now uh, we'll have the impact of GMO on the environment. 
So more than 80% of all genetically modified grapes grown worldwide have been engineered for herbicide uh, tolerance. So as a result, the use of toxic herbicides such as Roundup has increased 15-fold since GMOs were first introduced. So in March 2015, the World Health Organization determined that herbicide glyphosate, the key ingredient in Roundup, is probably carcinogenic to humans. So when we say, to, when we say it's carcinogenic, that means to say um, that it's is uh, cancer causing uh, cancer causing chemicals okay or cancer uh, yes it's a, it's, a, it's a cancer causing chemicals uh, because we're talking here about uh, about glyphosate okay so genetically modified crops also are responsible for the emergence of super weeds and super bugs which can only be killed with even more toxic poisons such as uh, 2,4-D uh, which is a major ingredient in agent orange okay so uh, most uh, GMOs are a direct extension of chemical agriculture and are developed and sold by the world's largest chemical companies. The long-term impact of these GMOs are unknown, so once released into the environment, these novel organisms can, can no longer be recalled. Okay, so that ends my presentation. Uh, these are the sources. Um, of the ideas I have, and uh, this uh, your task for this one is, you are going to write a brief possession paper regarding GMOs. So the focus of your paper should be on the realized impacts, uh, future impacts, and ethics of GMOs. So you'll be graded to the following criteria: ideas, thirty points; organization, five points; sentence fluency, that's five points; convention, five points; and presentation five points so again please limit the number of your words to contain in your essay to 500 words if possible so for your information on writing on writing position paper please refer to this website okay so that ends my presentation for today and thank you for listening goodbye